Matthew chapter 20. We're going to pick up uh, verse 17 through verses 28. If you are able, uh, would you uh, please stand uh, in recognition of the Word of God. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside. And on the way, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity we have to gather here this morning uh, under your word in the fellowship of brothers and sisters. Father, may you be honored through our actions and words and time this morning. And Father, we praise you and give all glory and honor to you in Christ's name. Amen. So as we're walking through the Gospel of Matthew, as we've said, this is nearing the end of Jesus' public ministry. As a matter of fact, as we get into the 21st chapter of Matthew, you will see uh, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So he has uh, made his way around Galilee. He has uh, performed miracles. He has taught. He has ministered. He is raising up his disciples who are still struggling. They're still not quite fully understanding. They've grasped some parts of what he's been uh, sharing with them, but there are still others they are not fully grasping yet. They, they don't understand fully that Jesus is ultimately going to Jerusalem to face the cross. He is going uh, to Jerusalem to die for us in our place. But as he is getting very close, in matter of fact, just a, a short time from this passage, he will be in Jerusalem. And so as this passage starts out, it talks about the fact that he's going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem sits on the hill. So any way you go to Jerusalem, you have to travel up. You are going to be heading up a mountain. So as uh, the Bible gives us very clear distinctiveness in so many areas here, it's showing and telling us that they were going to be traveling up to Jerusalem. And knowing that is uh, what is to occur, he is going to, again, pull the twelve aside and try to uh, share with them so that they will understand that ultimately he is going uh, to be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes. They are the ones that are the religious leaders. Uh, they are the ones that will ultimately uh, lead uh, in trying to, or ultimately him being crucified. They will uh, try him. Uh, it'll be a, uh, a, a false accusation that they will use against him. And then ultimately they will turn him over, it says, to the Gentiles, which are the Romans, for the Romans are the ones who will ultimately uh, crucify Christ. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says of this passage, Here were three sharp words. One scarcely knows which had the keenest edge. Our hearts ought to melt as we think of this threefold sorrow, scorn, cruelty, and death. Our blessed master, however, added a word which overpowered the bitterness of the death draught. Here was the bright lining of the black cloud. The third day he shall rise again. So he is speaking very clearly that these are the things that will happen to him. That over the course of the next few months as we uh, walk through the rest of Matthew we will see. But he will be mocked, he will be flogged, he will be crucified. 
He will be humiliated. They will do all they can to make a mockery of our king. But it is all part of God's ultimate plan. He knew very well that Christ would endure this shame and suffering, but that he would ultimately be raised on the third day, conquering sin and death so that we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, this passage goes from here, and we'll be uh, talking more of this over the uh, months to come. But then it takes an, an interesting turn. Uh, I don't know how many of you have a mom uh, that was always quick to defend you. Anybody? Anybody? Any moms in here, right? Any moms? You're very quick. Don't mess with my kids, right? Mama bears. They don't like people to... Yes, amen. Uh, so we have to understand this. You've got to kind of understand this from the perspective that uh, uh, this mom is truthfully looking out for her sons. I mean, she really is. Uh, this is the, the mom of John and James. Uh, she is, uh, by most historical accounts, she is actually the mother of Mary. Uh, we get that when we look through scriptures in its entirety. And I'm going to give that to you real quickly uh, so you know that I'm not just completely pulling this out. Uh, but this uh, mom is, is Salome. Uh, she is uh, married to Zebedee, which we hear frequently uh, when we hear of James and John, that they are the sons of Zebedee because uh, in scripture, uh, that's how they would, uh, you would know of whose family one was from. So you are the sons of such and such. So here throughout the Gospel of Matthew, as well as other Gospel accounts, we see James and John identified as the sons of Zebedee. We go all the way back to when Jesus calls the disciples. If you remember, uh, James and John, Andrew and Peter are what? Right? They're delivery truck drivers, right? I was waiting for a response. But they are what? Fishermen, right? So as he goes, he calls these men from fishing uh, to come and to follow him. So in Matthew 4, it says that in going on from there, Jesus saw two brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with their father Zebedee. So Zebedee was also a fisherman. So these boys had come about a very natural work from being around their father. So we know scripturally that's who they are, uh, that is who their dad is. The second part is that uh, if we look at the end of Matthew, which we will get to, uh, probably not till spring, but it says, standing among the women near the cross with Jesus' mother Mary, was the mother of Zebedee's children. And so in, in Matthew 27, we see among which was Mary Magdalene. These are the women that were at the cross. Because where were the men? They had scattered, right? The men had fled. And by the way, we would have done the same thing, men. So we, I don't care how big and bad we think we are. If we saw our king on the cross being crucified, we would be in hiding. Let's, let's be honest about that. We would not be standing there uh, pretending to think we are going to be uh, right there beside him because we wouldn't. In our human nature, in our fallen state, we would have fleed just as quickly. Um, but interesting, the women are the ones standing there. They're also the ones, right, that will go, uh, uh, go to the tomb. It says, standing there around uh, the crucifixion, among them was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee. Zebedee's uh, boys. So we know she was one who was there at the cross. Then again, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, we see, again, uh, talking about around the cross. It says, standing among the women near the cross with Jesus' mother Mary was Salome. And that's in Mark 15. There were also women looking, on afar, looking from afar, among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joses, and Salome. And then um, we read in John also about the fact that Salome uh, is there. It says that now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister. I don't know why, but for, I mean, I've never it took much uh, notice of that before. So anyway, by most theological accounts, if you disagree with me, wonderful, wonderful. I'm just telling you from my study and reading the theologians and the historians, most would attribute that Salome, the mother of James and John, 
as to be Mary's sister, which if in fact is the case, would make John and James Jesus' first cousin. So I understand. They're all from a very small area, so they clearly uh, knew each other. So just to give you that little bit of information there so you can kind of have that. Um, again, that's just through the study to give you a little idea. I think it does uh, create, uh, uh, helps a little bit in understanding this background because when we read again in Matthew 20, verse 20, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. I mean, she, she knew Jesus. She would have known him well. Um, this is, again, a small community. These uh, disciples, uh, at least uh, these four we've mentioned, are from a very small community. But she comes to him, and I want you to, uh, to kind of understand this, this backdrop. She is a mother who is looking out for her boys. She, she truly is. She wants what's best for them. She is desiring the best for them. I mean, if you were a mom and your boys are following Jesus, you would want the same thing. You're not thinking about the ultimate cost because remember, the disciples are still not fully grasping the fact that Jesus is going to die, that he is going to be put to death. They're not fully grasping this yet. So she is desiring that they would be allowed to sit at his right and his left hand. But notice how she comes before our Lord. First point, it is a petition of worship. It says, when she came kneeling before him. So who, what does she recognize in Jesus as? She is recognizing him as the Messiah, the anointed one. She is recognizing this is, this is God incarnate. Because she would not just kneel before a, a, a random carpenter from Nazareth unless there's something about him. So she kneels before him and she is going to ask this question uh, for her sons. In other gospel accounts, it actually shows her sons asking this question and that is not a contradiction. Okay, um, If we look through scriptures, uh, scripture in its entirety, we will understand that. But great was this mom's faith. Because she had faith that the Lord's ultimate victory would be he would reestablish the throne of David. Remember, they're looking forward to the ultimate uh, eternal king who would take the throne of David and reign eternally. And so she is showing an ultimate sign of faith here that she knows who the Lord is and that he could uh, place her two sons in these positions. She is... Uh, showing him uh, worship by kneeling. Uh, worship simply means the, the reverence paid to a divine being. And if Jesus was offered and then equally accepted this worship, then he in so doing is confirming his divinity, that he is in fact God. We see also this happened. Uh, let's go back to the early parts of the Gospel of Matthew when the wise men uh, come to visit it says they went into the house and they saw the child and Mary his mother and they did what? They kneeled down, class, and worshipped him. Then they opened their bags and gave him gifts. So they showed that they too knew that this little baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, a horse trough, in the back of a stable, in a real tiny village called Bethlehem. This is not this booming metropolitan area. But yet this was in fact the Lord God Almighty. Then we also read in Psalm 95. It says, let us sing songs of praise. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all lowercase gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. When we come before the Lord, we come with a, a reverency and an awe, an anticipation, and we come to him because we are worshiping the one true God. As Richard Baxter once said, 
I was but a pen in God's hands, and what praise is due to a pen. Think about that for a minute, right? Anybody ever, we don't, right? Now, I do understand the old friend, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword, blah, 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 right? Okay. But you get what he's saying? He is saying, what praise is due a pen? No, is all praise and glory to the Father. So she shows a reverence and awe as she kneels before him. But remember, Jesus is God, right? So he knows the thoughts of Mary's. He knows the thoughts of Salome's heart. He knows the thoughts of the disciples. He knows your thoughts. He knows the most uh, deepest, darkest thoughts you and I have. The ones that we think no one knows, God already knows. And that's how we can come to him in confidence and in boldness before the throne of God. But then notice, after this, uh, he says to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine to sit one on your right hand. Notice his response. And his response is that to follow Christ requires unconditional surrender. He is going to make it very clear that they are, if they are to truly follow him, there will be a great cross, cost. Uh, George Mueller, who had started many orphanages and was a tremendous minister of the gospel uh, hundreds of years ago, said, through prayer and meditation on the word, becoming willing to let God have all the glory, if any good is accomplished by your service, if, any, if you desire honor for yourself, the Lord must put aside as a vessel unfit for the master's use. One of the greatest qualifications for usefulness in the service of the Lord is a heart that truly desires to honor Him. And that goes against our, our natural man, our natural self. That goes completely against it. Uh, our natural self is, to, is that we, we want to be recognized. We want to be uh, known. We want people to know our name. We want to walk in cheers and everyone know our name. Amen? You do. We all do. That's part of who we are. But he is saying that to ultimately serve the Lord is that we would not be known, but Christ would be known. So he asked this question, who do you think, who, you do not know what you're asking, are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? So he makes this very clear to them, and we may be wondering, well, what is this cup? What is this that he is speaking of? Well, if you go over to Matthew 26, uh, we will get a, a, a glimpse as to what this cup is. So there we see Jesus. He is, uh, has just been betrayed. He has been betrayed by one who is as close as a brother. He has gone to the garden. Uh, the Last Supper has finished. And he is going to pray. He is going to seek this time of solitude. He is going to be with his Father. And as he goes, he takes the disciples with him, the, the 11 that are still with him. He brings them along and he asks them to even pray with him. He wants them to, uh, to be there, to be alert. And he says in verse 36 of chapter 26, Then Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane. And it means uh, an olive press. It's where the, uh, the olive trees are there. If you go today, you'll see these. I mean, literally, they could have been there when Jesus was there because they are old but it was there that the olives were uh, gathered in the big presses there, and they would press the olives into olive oil. So it is, it is a significant place for Jesus to go. He would have came and crossed over uh, the Kidron Valley outside the walls of Jerusalem, and he would have started to ascend. It is actually at the base of the Mount of Olives. If you were to continue to go up uh, this mount, you would get to the Mount of Olives where we know Christ will ultimately what? Descend. It's when he comes back. It says that he will stand forth on the Mount of Olives. So as he, as he goes to Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. We know that Peter, James, and John did have... Uh, as we would see in Scripture, some uh, seemingly some higher level of uh, authority. They were in a, a little more intimate relationship, it seems, with, with our Savior because they were allowed to be part of things that the other nine were not. And look, they probably had uh, were, were wrestling with this. So when we see later in our current text uh, this occur, we understand that this is just uh, something they always had wrestled with. It says, He began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, these three, remember he's got Peter, James, and John with him. He says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, 
my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So what is this cup? So this cup that Jesus in the garden is praying that if it be possible, if the Father would will it, and he would not have to take this cup because that cup was going to be the full wrath of God. He knew fully well within just hours he would be flogged, he would be humiliated, he would be forced to carry his cross down the Via Dolorosa as he was headed to Calvary. And as this would occur, and he knew that ultimately there on the cross, he would take all our sin, past, present, future, all the sin would be placed upon him. Paul reminds us, for he who knew no sin became sin for our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God. He endured our sin. He became sin. We don't think about that, but that means on the cross, Jesus became a murderer. He became a thief. He became the adulterer. He became a liar. He became all those because he took our full sin and he felt the full wrath of a holy God who cannot look upon sin. We say it wasn't the nails that held him on the cross, but understand, he did not just die for you and me. He died to fulfill the plan in which his father sent him to do. Don't ever miss that. He did die for you. He died for all those who had placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. But he died to fulfill what his father required. See, death was what was required for sin. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So he knew this cup was what awaited him. And as he is speaking to James and John, he says to them, are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? Only two boys, two brothers. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus, whatever you say, we'll do it. We'll drink it. We don't know what's in it, but we'll drink it, right? You ever drink something you did not know what was in it? And I'm talking about it's just weird or disgusting, you know? And, and you just were like, uh, all right, you know, I mean, there's a few high school boys that'll do that. Most others won't do that, right? So they, they don't get it, right? They don't know what this cup is. That it's, it's really the wrath of God. But notice what he says to them. Verse 21, he says, you will drink it. You will drink it. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. He says, you are going to drink it. We know that James will be the first martyr. James will be the first of those who followed Christ who would die for his faith. John's the only disciple who does not face a physical death, but he faced a, an, an, an unimaginable torment. I mean, he was literally dipped in boiling oil when he uh, was forced they faced a great deal. They did have to drink this cup. Serving in the kingdom of God requires great sacrifice and suffering. That's why the gate is narrow. For wide is the way of destruction. While the mind of Jesus was on his impending death, his followers were still looking to have honor and ease. And so are we, even today. We want the easy route. We don't want to pay uh, a price. We, we understand that, okay, there's some level of cost to following Christ, but the ultimate, cry, the ultimate sacrifice is to give fully of ourselves. To be near to the throne of the king would involve fellowship with him in his suffering and self-sacrifice. Francis, Francis Schaeffer says, Who can do more? We with our own energy and wisdom or the God who created heaven and earth and who can work in space-time history with a power which none of us has. When we were in Christ, we can. We can't otherwise. But then 
just as he says these words, notice the conflict. That's what always happens, right? And when the ten heard it, the other ten, not James and John, the other ten heard it, what? They were indignant. They were mad. <laughs> Who are you to think you can sit at Jesus' right and left hand? That's where I'm supposed to sit. They weren't mad because John and James asked to sit at his right and left, or that, Mary, or that uh, Salome, their mother, asked. They were mad that they didn't ask first. <laughs> They're thinking the same thing. They thought they should have. All of them probably in some way, shape, or form felt that they were the ones who should be given this great honor. It says, But Jesus called them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Remember that Rome is, uh, is, is oppressing the people. Rome here are the Gentiles. They are lording over all the uh, children of Israel. They are under their restrictions. They have to do as they are told. But these men are here still jockeying for position. Uh, he could serve the most. Uh, they thought that should be the person who would be given the greatest honor, not the lowest. And so uh, we see as well over in uh, Timothy, uh, it says, um, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. And again, are we in the last days? Yes. They started in Acts chapter 2. Everybody, we good? We've been in the last days since Jesus ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And we will be in the last days until he returns. So every day we are closer. But we've been here for a while. For people, does this sound familiar? For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unpeaceable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, rather than the lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its powers. And notice Paul's words to Timothy. Avoid such people. He's saying that there's going to be people. For among them are those who creep into households. And then at the last verse here on this passage in, uh, in 1 Timothy, he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If we are to be faithful, if we are to surrender all. You know that song we sang that we lie every time we sang it? We all do. I mean, every one of us, right? I surrender all. All for Jesus. I mean, we honestly don't surrender much. Amen? I don't. I mean, let's be real, right? We live in the freest country in the world. We pretty much can know we're going to be able to go home tonight. We're going to be able to get into our homes, comfortable homes, nice beds. We've got people that, that love us. You know, we don't face a lot. I mean, I don't even want to put a percentage there, but I mean, I'm saying that in reality, we probably surrender very little, right? We don't really face a great deal. Now, are we? Probably, eventually. So to rise in Christ's kingdom, we must descend. He would be chief or first among saints, must be their servant, bondsman or slave. Remember Paul's progression? The apostle Paul, right? He starts off early in his ministry. He says, I'm the, I'm the least of all the apostles. Right? He says, as one untimely born, I'm the least of all these. Right? Jesus has called these, these apostles, the disciples, to follow him. He called me. I'm the least of these. I'm the least, wor I'm the least worthy. I mean, he understood. I mean, Paul is the one who says, of himself, I am a wretched man. That's Paul's definition of who he is. And then later in his ministry, he says, I am the least of all the saints. So he says, hey, out of all those that God calls into himself, I view myself as the least. And by the time he's writing his, his swan song, his farewell to his beloved disciple, to his beloved son in, son in the faith, what does he say? He says, I am the chief of all sinners. You see, as we grow in Christ, we actually have revealed to us more and more of our own sinfulness because as we're conformed into the image of Christ, as we are slowly growing in Christ, those impurities are going to be more and more exposed. And we're going to be putting on more of Christ. And so these boys did not understand at this point what the ultimate price would be. Last point here. We see 
after uh, in verse 26, he says, It shall not be among you. For whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is the model. He is the model for servanthood. Paul, again, to the church in Corinth says, Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Jesus is the example. And we will fall short. We will always fall short. But that is the standard by which we are working towards. He who is greatest and chief among us has set us the ultimate example of love and sacrificial service. No servants waited on him. He himself was master and Lord. He washed his servants' feet. He came not to serve, but to serve. He received nothing from others. He, in fact, was the life giver, was the one who gives life to all. And for this purpose, he is the son of man. He is the one who gave his life. It was not taken from him. He gave his life as a ransom for many. Luke reminds us, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. He is the one who is seeking you and I. We're the ones playing hide and seek. We are not the ones seeking after the Lord. He comes. He seeks us out. Jerry Bridges says, We all know people, even unbelievers, who seem to be a natural servant. They are always serving others one way or another. But God in that does not get the glory they do. It is their reputation that is enhanced. But when we natural servants or not, serve in dependence upon the grace of God with the strength he supplies, God is glorified. Jesus came to give his life so that we might live as free. The word ransom is uh, interesting. It's the idea here that he, he gave himself up. Uh, a big word here is, is the, the penal substitutionary atonement. It means that Jesus took the very penalty that you and I should have to uh, receive. The penalty for sin is death. He took that penalty and then he substituted his life for ours. He, as Martin Luther says, he, he calls it the great exchange. He exchanged his life for you and for me. He took our penalty. He took on our sin. He took on our shame. He bore the brunt. He bore the full wrath of his heavenly father. And then he atoned for our sins. He he made right. He satisfied the father. He, He did all that was required of him. He led faithfully. He served faithfully. Uh, other passages for sake of time I won't get into, but Isaiah 53, 11, Romans 5, 12 through 17 are, are great passages to read uh, to further understand all that was paid. He paid it all. He get, he and to give his life as a ransom for many. Notice it says for many. It's not for all. For those who reject Christ, for those who have not been saved by faith. He paid the penalty for all those who by faith. We love John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believes may have eternal life. He lived the perfect life, the life that you and I could not live. He died the death we should have died so that we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. We're going to very shortly uh, have uh, communion, which is the Lord's Supper. And as we uh, partake in that this morning, consider that that is a a reminder for us. And uh, Bill will, will, will share about that. But he gave his life, and this is the reminder of what he did for us. And he served faithfully. And I want to encourage us all, and I'm so thankful though and I am very thankful for this that there are so many amongst us that are so faithful in their service I love to see uh, when those that are serving and everybody can do something everybody can do something I love seeing some of our uh, ladies that um, have raised their families already and even raised grandkids in the back serving faithfully 
uh, with younger uh, moms or younger ladies with their infants and toddlers. And by the way, as a church, we, we keep getting younger and older simultaneously, which is a glorious thing, right? We got people having babies, just that's praise God, people having babies, which means there's going to be more and more babies and toddlers back there. And I know that Paige and others work to try to make sure they pair people up so that you're, you're never alone back there anyway. But great opportunities. And with that, too, um, a couple things we need. And uh, we need a couple of men that will help us in the parking lot. Because believe it or not, uh, some people don't pay attention on this little gravel road, and they fly through here. And, and honestly, like, we've seen this the last couple of weeks. I mean, because, you know, you've got kids, and I get it. I totally get it. Trains go by. So I need some men to go to Randall today and say, look, I can help out in the parking lot. I'm not talking about security inside. I'm seeing in the parking lot because, you know, we, if you've got kids, grandkids, you understand, right? It, we're always looking out. But we got some people who fly. And then sometimes it's hard to see in the parking lot itself. So we need some men. It's a rotational thing. The more and the easier it gets. It's before service and after service. Uh, after service is the big one. So like when we're, we're kind of winding up, you just go out. We'll give you a cool vest and a Bob the Builder hat. And uh, you can stand out there and just make sure everyone stays safe. Because that's what we want to do is all we can. It's a simple way of service. We would love it if there's a possibility for some people to help that. Also, just as an act of service. And I know you may disagree with this, and you have every right to be wrong. But, but if you can, we're asking you, especially folks that have been here a while, I want you to, you're going to practice this with me, okay? Sit close. Practice with me. Sit close. Sit close. And park far. And park far, okay? If you are more than capable of walking, Park. We got new spots right out here too, which we also want to keep available as much as we can. But so those of you that need to be closer, um, we want to do that. But also, we don't want a family with young kids having to park in the back 40. And they got to walk all the way up here because guess what? We take all the good spots. I know it's simple, and yet it's hard at the same time. So I want to encourage you. Remember last uh, week, Jesus said, the first will be last and the last will be first. So park far. Practice with me. Park far and sit close, okay? These are the best seats in the house, right, Daniel? I mean, they're wonderful. It's like, it's like, it's like Shamu Stadium. It's like Splash Zone right here. Everybody wants to sit there, right? No, no one sit there. And listen, if you're, if you're new with us, you may not want to sit in the front. I get it. But that's why sit to the front. Choice seats are for our visitors, our guests. Because guess what they don't want to do? Sit in the front, right? So... We're going to reverse it. Or I'll just start preaching from the back. And I'll wander through the crowd. That'll work too. That, that's, so, that's fine. Um, I don't need to be in front of you. I'd rather, I'd rather not be in front of you. So if you could help us with that, that would be a wonderful thing to help us in that endeavor. I mean, the kids went out today. And so when the kids are in here, it does get really full. So we want to be uh, help, helping to open up places so uh, people can come and join us. So remember those two things. You can also uh, park along the tracks. Just please be careful if you do that. Um, there are train tracks over there. And, uh, you, have, you know, we don't want anybody down in that ditch. So... We need some parking lot help. Let uh, Randall or Mitch or myself know. And just, you know, we, we want to be faithful servants. And it's why, you know, I just, I just love. I, and, and I will brag about them for a minute, and that's okay. But, but I love through the ages that they just constantly are looking for opportunities to serve. And, and by the way, that ministry is the fastest growing ministry in this church. It is growing, and they're growing in ways of service. And they are reaching people we've got multiple new partners that will be voting in next month and they're they're the ones bringing folks in and inviting people and encouraging people and then they're getting involved and you know the one group i never hear one word of complaint from them never a one if anything they're like what more can we do what do we do right asked a week ago for a little project and they'll you know, they'll take that and run with it and it'll it'll be awesome so i'm just saying Find a way to serve. Do something. There's so many things that we can do. Faithfully serve. We're going to have a lot of folks who get to serve tonight. So I encourage you. And understand, Jesus is the servant model. So let me pray for us. And then uh, Bill's going to come up here and lead us in Lord's Supper. Father, we thank you for your precious word that, God, you have set the ultimate example. You gave your only begotten son 
Father, your word declares that, and yet while we were sinners, Christ Jesus died. That, Father, you sent Jesus here for us on the greatest rescue mission ever. And, Father, you have called us to yourself that we would come surrender our lives to you. So, Father, I pray this morning for anyone here that has never by faith trusted in Jesus Christ alone, that today would be the day of salvation, that they would talk to one of our elders this morning at some point today, Father, and share what your Spirit is doing, drawing them to yourself. Father, for your word declares, if Jesus Christ be lifted up on high, you will draw all peoples to yourself. So, Father, we celebrate with you the work that you are doing, God. It is not a work on our own. We are not the ones that can save anyone. But, Father, we can share the gospel and we can then sit back and just celebrate as your spirit draws people. And that for those that need to take that first step of obedience and publicly declare their faith through baptism, I pray that they would let us know. Check one of the cards in the seat backs or just let, again, one of our elders know, Father. We love to celebrate uh, when people uh, publicly proclaim their faith. And Father, lastly, we just pray that you would stir up in our hearts and we would take the gifts, the talents, the abilities that you have blessed us with. And may we use those for your good and your glory. And wherever they are, Father, may we do so and then step back and that you receive all glory and honor. We love you, Father. You are so good and gracious. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.